You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Swatting often involves a cyber nexus. You know, you can hire somebody on the dark web to make those fake calls. And that's where a lot of this stuff begins. And like any type of incident, we need run books and preparation. And I think there's a lot we can learn out of this incident. So that's first off why I think this even fits in our swim lane to talk about. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. On this episode, we have our very special guest, Caleb Barlow from CyberBit. He joins us with a conversation about swatting. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. All right, Ben. So it is always a pleasure to welcome back to the show, Caleb Barlow. Caleb, thanks for taking the time for us today. Oh, happy to be here, guys. So we are going to dig in today on a very interesting case that involves swatting here. Uh, Caleb, you want to uh, set the scene for us? What are we talking about today? Well, first of all, let's talk about why we're talking about this. Like, why is this in our swim lane? And, you know, first off, swatting often involves a cyber nexus. You know, you can hire somebody on the dark web to make those fake calls. And that's where a lot of this stuff begins. And Swatting can impact individuals, like if many people remember back to when Brian Krebs, uh, who's obviously pretty famous in the cybersecurity industry, was swatted in his home or, uh, you know, businesses, public places. And, and like any type of incident, we need run books and preparation. And I think there's a lot we can learn out of this incident. So that's first off why I think this even fits in our swim lane to talk about, Dave. I mean, there's been some deaths People have died from being swatted. You know, uh, only a handful, but it has happened. And we actually saw over the holiday break, several members of Congress were swatted as I was just going to say that, including prominent ones. I I know uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia has been swatted like five times. Whatever you think of her, like, that's really, really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing is, you know, I think part of what we have to talk about, and that's why this incident is such a good case study, is the mere act of... Lots of police responding with guns drawn to an incident and people's reaction to that can easily go sideways. And and what we're going to talk about today is a really good case study. So let me kind of set the stage here. So this was a swatting incident purporting to be a school shooting. Okay. Now, we're not going to mention the name of the school or the police department. I don't want to cause any undue harm here. In fact, why this is so interesting is all those people did everything right. Now, This is a true story. It actually happened. And it's a well-funded private high school in Massachusetts. Faculty, staff, students, they had all drilled. They, you know, this is a a school that had all the preparation in place. They had an emergency notification system to students, faculty, and parents in place. They had the ability to lock down the entire school. And most importantly, they had taken the steps to practice with their local police department on the response. So You know, well-prepared, well-funded, no issues there. It should also be noted as we talk about this and why this is such a good case study is nobody was actually hurt. So, you know, no one died here, but things went horribly wrong. And the way this went down is the swatting incident begins, and on the same day, multiple calls were made to multiple calls, multiple schools in Massachusetts pretending to be school shooters. Now, at the other schools, the police showed up, they realized that there wasn't a shooter and everybody kind of quickly stood down. And unfortunately, 
I think most schools are now kind of used to getting an occasional swatting incident or a bomb threat, and, and they have good policies and procedures for this. Yeah, I, let me just interject. I mean, I, I as someone who has a, a high schooler, you know, they drill for this. They have their lockdown drills. I, uh, I can one-up you. I was at my daughter's elementary school. She's in first grade for a Christmas party, and they had a lockdown drill. Well, all the parents were there. I was locked down in the lobby. It was a drill, but it was it just kind of one of those reminders of the age we live in. Yeah. Now, well, and I can one-up both of you in that my child actually went to this school, which is why I know so much about this oh, incident. Wow. So all right. I can also give you a little bit from the parents' perspective here as well. So let's talk about what happened. Okay. So local police get a call on their business line. There's a person in the bathroom at the high school with a long gun. Six to eight officers immediately respond, and we should note that the police department is literally down the other end of the street from the high school. So it takes mere seconds for the police to get to the school. The first responding officer jumps the curb with their police car, drives it right down the sidewalk, enters the school with a long gun drawn. Now, this is happening so quickly that simultaneously, the police are calling the school to let them know that they've had a report of a swatting incident, literally at the same time the first officer is walking in the door. That officer tells students to run as they enter the building. The initial group of officers enters the bathroom, determines that there's no threat, there's no shooter, and I think they quickly start to realize that this is a nothing burger. And you can, you can there's video of this, and you can actually see the officers start to stand down, holster their weapons. Um, but this is where things go sideways. So one of the officers, as he's holstering his weapon, it gets caught on his belt and the weapon discharges into the floor. Now, luckily it misses the officer. Again, no one was hurt, but now you have a shot fired inside of a school. And remember, this is a school where people are well-trained. They have rehearsed this. Every teacher in that school knows if they hear a shot fired, immediately dial 911. 911 is immediately flooded with calls from the school. Shots fired, active shooter in the school. Which now, is kind of true. Right. Well, it is true. They're doing <laughs> exactly what they were right. trained. Right. right. Okay. An announcement goes out over the loudspeaker at the school, and I've heard this recording from a administrator, active shooter, and the administrator is nearly in tears. So you can imagine the reaction that this then causes across, and this is a campus, it isn't just one building, across the entire campus. So this now goes to a full response from 911. Now what that means is it turns out the state police barracks, now a whole barracks, is on the other end of the street from this school. The entire barracks empties out and heads towards this school. 12 local police departments immediately self-deploy because this is what they're trained to do. They hear school shooting, they hear active shooter. They don't even wait for the call for mutual aid. They immediately respond. Now, what also happens though is in every classroom where this announcement has gone out over the loudspeaker, they're trained, flee, hide, or fight. Flee was chosen by the many of the students and faculty on the first floor. They literally ran into the woods. Hide was chosen by the faculty and students on upper floors. And, you know, at about the same time as they start barricading themselves in classrooms, the regional SWAT, and in this area of Massachusetts, each police department has a couple of members of the police department that are part of a regional SWAT team. They all have their own gear and vehicles. So now there are literally dozens and dozens of SWAT vehicles, everything from, you know, old police vans to, you know, tactical units headed towards this school. Now, the response here of students and faculty is interesting. And again, this is what people are trained for, flee, hide, or fight. But you can quickly gather where this could have gone very wrong. In some classrooms, and it should be noted, you know, they even had teachers in some of these classrooms that had actually been in tragic situations in school shootings before, when I say these classrooms were trashed, I am not exaggerating. If it was not nailed down, it went up against the door in these classrooms. Computers, desks, everything immediately thrown against the door, causing, I don't know how much damage, but uh, quite consequential. 
Some of the stories were amazing too, though, of people, again, because they thought this was an active shooter, people on crutches and kids carrying them into the woods, students staying with older teachers that were unable to run on their own to make sure that they could get to safety. Outside the school, seniors, because this was at the point of the year where seniors had already graduated, self-organized on social media to come get their you know, young underclassmen and transport them out of the area. There were kids that were found on I-95, which is near the school, major interstate, hitchhiking home, literally ran out to the highway and thumbed away home and other students going to pick them up. Neighbors opened their homes, but in some cases actually grabbed their weapons and headed towards the school. Wow. Yeah. Now you can imagine a whole bunch of ways that can go wrong when you have a responding officer seeing somebody running towards the school with a gun. Right. Um, local businesses organized uh, to provide safe harbor for students and parents. In total, somewhere between 150 and 200 officers responded. Four to five helicopters were in the air, and all area schools went on lockdown. Quite a story. But again, what makes this so interesting for this forum is let's now talk about the implications of this, what can go wrong, and the legal aspects of this. Well, I mean, okay, so... Where's a good place to begin? Should we start with who should be held responsible for this incident in a, from a legal perspective? Sure. Because that's where things get really interesting. And as soon as I heard this story, something triggered my brain to my 1L uh, torts class, which is really the worst place your brain can trigger you to. <laughs> uh, I hear that's an incredibly exciting class. <laughs> I That was like a three cup of coffee class for me. <laughs> Con law was like a one cup of coffee. This was, yeah, maybe four. Uh, but there was this famous case, of course, I couldn't remember the name of it, but uh, I pulled it up, called Paul's Graph v. Long Island Railroad. And for those of you who are attorneys, you definitely learned about this case in law school, though you might have forgotten about it. And I'm just going to briefly describe the facts of this case and tell me if you think this sounds familiar. Hmm. So a woman named Helen Paul's Graph was waiting at a Long Island Railroad station. Uh, this is in 1924. She's trying to take her daughters to, uh, to the beach. Two guys tried to board the train before hers. One of them was being aided by a railroad employee. So there was a guy who was like pushing this other individual onto a moving train. This guy was carrying a package. That package exploded. That explosion caused a large, quote, coin-operated scale on the platform to hit her. Uh, and she began to stammer and she sued the railroad basically alleging that the employees uh, had been negligent. Uh, so she was trying to hold the Long Island Railroad Company liable for what happened to her here. Hmm. What this is getting at is how you determine proximate causation in terms of legal responsibility in an incident like this. Generally, any entity, whether it be a person, a cyber criminal, group of cyber criminals is only going to be held liable if the consequences that flowed from their actions were reasonably foreseeable from their actions. And what the court held in this Long Island Railroad case is that what happened here, where a person's package fell, knocked over whatever it was, this coin-operated thing, scale on the platform. Mm -hmm. So that was the thing they had in the 20s, apparently. 100-year <laughs> anniversary of this case, by the way. So it, the court held that the defendant could not be held liable for an injury that could not have reasonably been foreseen. And I'm wondering if you think this case is applicable to what happened here and what the lesson would be if you think it is applicable in terms of who we hold responsible and how big of a punishments should be levied against uh, the people who caused the swatting incident in the first place. Well, and, and of course, what also gets, you know, becomes an interesting kind of variable on this is, you know, in this case, I don't think anybody has any idea who, uh, who caused it. In some cases, this could be some, you know, individual far, far away just trying to cause disruption. It could be a kid that, you know, didn't want to take their exam today, or it could be some form of protest in any number of reasons, Right. But, you know, there are kind of two actors that are often involved in this. The person that paid for it, and more often than not, the cyber criminal offering the service to make the phone call on the dark web. 
Uh, because unless you're a, a stupid cyber criminal, you're not making this phone call from your cell phone. <laughs> right. And there are stupid criminals out there. There are a few. I've watched few. enough Jay Leno episodes over the years. In so, general, yeah. crooks are stupid. Yeah. Yes. But I guess my question for you would be, let's, ju let's just say law enforcement figured all this out, right? Like, how do you divide up responsibility from the person running the service versus the person that paid for it? That's a really interesting question. I mean... I think they're both they should both be held liable because it's somebody who had a criminal state of mind uh, and is an accomplice here, basically solicited somebody else to commit the crime and then the person who committed the crime. I mean, I think it's like hiring a hitman, yeah. And in that case, the person who hires the hitman, if that person solicits the crime, they can be held responsible for that same predicate crime. So if I solicit Dave to commit a murder on my behalf, Dave is criminally liable for that murder, and I am criminally liable for that murder. The solicitation merges with that substantive offense. So I think from both a criminal and civil perspective, I think you hold both the payer... Uh, so the person who solicited the cyber criminal to make the call and the cyber criminal himself liable. And I think you have to hold them both jointly and severably liable, as they say in our industry. Okay, well, let, let me throw another wrinkle into this. Right. So, you know, on the dark web, these services exist and they're everything from, you know, I can call it a bomb threat to I can, you know, claim that, uh, you know, someone that works in your office is a, uh, you know, is a... A, a sexual aggressor and, you know, they've done these horrible things to me. And I've heard some of the tapes of these calls. Like anything, if you do it enough, you get really good at it. In this case, where you're calling around to multiple schools, basically inflicting terror, does this cross the legal boundaries from a normal petty crime into some level of terrorism? And then I'm offering this service up for anybody to use to basically cause disruption across many, many communities. I don't think this fits in the legal definition of terrorism. And why is that? So terror as like a colloquial term is one thing, but I think the crime of terrorism is described as committing a crime with some type of political purpose to cause widespread uh, fear or apprehension among a population of people. And if you don't have like a broader goal in mind, generally that's the state of mind required for a federal terrorism charge is that there's some political element to it, uh, which makes it separate from just your standard garden variety criminal activity. That's my understanding of it. Uh, let me dig in uh, to a, a, a detail here. Um, what about the police officer who accidentally discharged their weapon? Is there any, uh, even, even out of negligence, is there, suppose this went even worse than it did and someone did end up injured or, God forbid, killed, would this officer have borne any responsibility for the negligence, for, for escalating things through the negligent use of their firearm? I mean, it depends on how you would evaluate negligence. So you'd compare this officer to a similarly situated officer. It's basically what would a reasonable officer have done under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. And you probably know this better than me, Caleb. Like in this circumstance, is this, is what the officer did, is that A, unusual and B, like, is there any indication that the officer was being negligent? Like maybe they didn't have the gun properly secured in their holster. Um, otherwise, I, I don't think there's any criminal or, or civil responsibility if it was just a straight accident, absent negligence. Well, and I think in this case, I mean, um, this was obviously all done above board. There was an investigation. Uh, I, as far as I know, I think the officer was cleared of everything. I mean, here's someone that was putting their own life you know, uh, on the line to respond very rapidly to the school to save these kids uh, from what they thought was a threat. But also what makes this such a good case study is there's video of all this. And I think you're going to include that link in the show notes. You can literally see the officer going to holster his weapon. It get caught and it accidentally discharges. So I think there's, in this case, there's very little question or doubt that this was just a freak accident. But, you know, there's another piece of this, though, which is that 
we have trained and spent so much time, especially around school shootings, in amping up the response to ensure that we, you know, the responding officers mitigate the threat. What strikes me about this is we haven't put anything into our run books and response plans, both for school shootings or even for a cyber incident, on how do we de-escalate? How do we rapidly spin an incident down? Because I think the thing we haven't recognized in our overall consciousness of this is during that period of time where we are operating on an on a elevated level of threat, we are also operating on an elevated level of risk that accidents can ha- you know you have police officers going down the road at high speeds, you have weapons drawn, you have you know people barricading themselves in rooms like there are lots of other things that can go wrong from the benign twisted ankle to somebody getting killed. Yeah, I mean, that, that was going to be my next question was the, the kind of the proportionality of the response. Um, and from a policy point of view, how we prepare the communications between our schools and law enforcement. And what I'm thinking of here is, If you had multiple swatting incidents in the same day across multiple schools, to me, that's a red flag that there probably isn't anything to this. Or maybe it could be that someone is actually going after one school, but they're calling it in at many as a misdirection. So you have to certainly have to consider that. But it seems to me like the point where the state police got involved and you have multiple helicopters overhead, is that a proportional response? And I get the precautionary principles here. I mean, if it were my child, I would want, you know, the brute force of local police and state police. And I understand people's impulses. But I I don't know if we've really reckoned with that as a society. Like, how much is too much in terms of mustering a response? And is there a level of response where it's so overwhelming that that entity should be liable, especially in, in civil court, uh, for whatever happens as a result of that overreaction. I don't think there's an easy moral answer to that question, especially given how many real incidents we've seen. Well, you know, one of the things I kind of bring to this that, you know, I spent a lot of time, as you guys know, from past conversations uh, coming out of the fire and EMS world, almost like another career when I was much younger. And, and, you know, one of the interesting things you learn is, let's say you respond to an incident, maybe it's a car accident and someone has died. One of the things they train you is that your patients change, right? You know, up to the point that you believe that people are alive when you're responding to this car accident, your patient is the person in the car. Once you know they've deceased and, you know, the, uh, at least if you watch any crime shows, you know, the blanket comes out and they get covered up, your patients are the bystanders. And I think one of the things people have realized is that, you know, there is a mental and emotional impact on family or other people that are around. And they train you to really make that shift. You know, once you know that you can't save the individual, how do you shift to the people that are around? And one of the things I think is so fascinating to learn out of this, because again, it escalated, no one was hurt. So we can very objectively look at it and say, okay, how do we fine tune our policies? Once you realize that, okay, this is indeed a nothing burger, and and of course, you've got to go through the process of confirming that, of clearing the school, how do you de-escalate rapidly? Because as long as you have young eyes seeing lots of police cars, sirens, parents responding in, thousands of text messages of all kinds of parade of horribles back and forth to parents of what's going on, how do you rapidly get everyone calmed down so you lessen the potential mental and long-term you know, trauma that's going on to the people that are watching this and the students that are involved? So I will say in what I've read uh, about the story from this school is that they did do a good job post hoc in terms of things like bringing in school counselors. It was so that, amazing. Yeah, I mean, that element of it is admirable and I think absolutely necessary. But I do think there has to be uh, some type of consideration on, you know, in the emergency management, EMS, law enforcement world, how, what is the appropriate way to de-escalate the situation to pre- prevent additional harm once you've determined that the threat isn't real? What's interesting to me is like, 
what percentage of bomb threats do you guys think actually come to pass where there's actually a bomb? It's got to be less than 1%, right? I would, yeah, yeah. So this is something that happens very frequently and it still causes panic. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, that's a really difficult question to wrestle with. And I'm wondering if there's, you know, something that can be introduced in the emergency management world that's part of the cycle of preparedness where you go through your, uh, preparation plans and your and your response plans, your preparedness plans and your response plans. And then as part of that response, there's a focus on de-escalation. Caleb, I'm curious. I mean, as someone who, this was your community, and as you unpacked this after the fact, what was your thought process of considering how appropriate the various levels of response were. I mean, it seems to me like you have two levels of thought here. You have the emotional response of of a your child being in the middle of something like this. But then beyond that, when you get past that emotional response, there's the rational response of, let me step us outside of my role as a parent and how do I feel? I'm curious, did you go through the, those two <laughs> those two avenues? I really did. I mean, the first thing uh, that happened is I hear I'm I'm working, and I hear a scream from my wife upstairs because she got a text from her Scott, her our son, active shooter. I love you. Oh like, my gosh! Yeah. What do you do with that? Now, okay, um, you know I I would at least like to consider myself someone that's calm under pressure. And I said, all right, first of all, we have no idea what's going on. Um, and my wife's first inclination was we need to head to the school. I'm like, no, let's find out what's going on first. So, you know, I turned on Broadcastify where you can hear, you know, fire and EMS uh, radios. And, you know, I could immediately hear what was going on. And I went from zero to 60 in about 10 seconds because I realized, oh, this actually is real. And... Then I hit my son with kind of, all right, let's break out my own run book on, okay, where are you? Where are your friends? Barricade yourself or get up above the ceiling tiles. And luckily, we were able to maintain uh, texting communications back and forth through most of it, mainly because he was on the second floor. One of the big lessons learned out of this, and I, I should mention first and foremost, The reason why I wanted to kind of bring this up as a case study is I truly believe everybody did everything by the book. Like I I have, this was so great about this is there really isn't a criticism you can lay on what anybody did, but we should all still take a step back and say, how could we do better, right? You know, this whole de-escalation issue came up. And I think the other thing that came up that I hadn't really thought about is, you know, you can imagine people don't really worry about the ability to have good cell signal in schools because if there's not a good cell signal, like there isn't on the first floor in most of these buildings, that's advantageous because kids aren't on their phones all day. But I think a lot of the parents' viewpoints really changed on that, that wait a second, not having the ability to communicate and know what's going on changes the response amongst parents in a very dramatic way. You know, the other issue is, what happens if something was happening in, you know, classroom five and you can't get a cell signal to direct responders to the right place? It's really interesting that you say this. I just did a project basically on this very subject. I was contracted to write a report on the advisability of having basically a panic button in public school systems. Hmm. Uh, And there are a bunch of different ways a panic button could work. One of them is that uh, an alert is automatically sent to all the phones in a particular geofenced area. Um, It turns out, and we got a lot of input from a bunch of different stakeholders, that what they really need is bidirectional antennae so that cell service is stronger within schools, uh, and better CAD-to-CAD communications between law enforcement agencies, computer-aided dispatch. It's like one of those things where, did we solve the terrorism problem after 9-11 by engaging in a 20-year war in Afghanistan? Or was it as simple as we reinforced cockpit doors so that it was much harder for people with box cutters to get into the cockpits? Mm. And so sometimes I wonder if it's like, maybe it's just these little things, like improving cell service or improving communication infrastructure among these agencies that might actually be more effective in solving the problem than some of these 
radical solutions that are going to be polarizing and difficult to implement. Well, the other thing I think we learned in this case study is that the community is going to respond. It's not a question of if, they're going to respond. You know, now whether that's a business, in in this case, it was a a grocery store opened their parking lot and their, you know, and the uh, their lobbies so that parents had a place to collect their students. It was neighbors. So the if the community is going to respond, you probably want to make sure they respond appropriately. Like, and the one example I use in this case is the neighbor that kind of got their weapon and headed towards the school. Now, on one hand, there's part of me that wants to applaud that because you know, you're you're taking this selfless act to make sure that these kids are okay. On the other hand, I could see where that could have gone horribly wrong if seen by a responding police officer, right? So, you know, I think part of this is also engaging the community. And the way to do that is through cell phones to say, hey, there's something going on here, shelter in place, uh, or be aware of this. Like, The good news here, I think when you engage the public, this is one of those events where when people are engaged, they're going to step in and help, but you need to be able to guide that help, or it could go in all kinds of bizarre situations. Another example being like, literally, there are a bunch of seniors that drove back to the school to go pick up their friends. Okay, on one hand, incredible selfless act. You want to applaud the, the fact that, you know, All of these seniors realized their friends were in trouble and self-organized. On the other hand, you were literally driving yourself back into the target zone or what you thought was the target zone. What are you doing? So, you know, I think community engagement is critical. We're going to take a quick break here, but more from our special guest, Kayla Barlow, when we come back. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. The point about cell phones, I, I remember uh, I, I'm old enough, I guess. Well, certainly Caleb, you and I are, Ben might not be, that, <laughs> that when Columbine happened, which I think was, if not the first, certainly it was the first big school shooting that I think had national attention. Right. It captured the zeitgeist in a way that nothing had before. Right. Yeah. So when that happened, we were still at the leading edge of cell phones and the idea of kids having cell phones. And at that time, the school policy that, that seemed to be being put in place was kids can't have cell phones at school. They, it was just simply, they are not permitted because they are disruptive. And Columbine changed that forever. Right. Because the parents said, you are not taking away my ability to communicate with my child in an emergency. And it's been that way ever since. Now, again, you know, a kid in high school, some teachers let the kids keep their phones. Some kids have a big... Uh, uh, you know, uh, hanging bag that has a bunch of slots in it at the front of the classroom, and the kids come in and they all put their, you know, put their devices in a numbered slot 
at the beginning of class and they pick them up at the end, which to me seems like a good compromise because if something goes bad, they still have access to the phone. Yeah. Right. right, exactly. But you're not you're not going to be uh, tempted with with it uh, during during school. But um, yeah, this notion of of having a robust signal in the school itself uh, is an interesting one. But uh, again, I. I I keep coming back to this idea of a proportionate response. I mean, Caleb, do you believe that again when the when the state got involved and you have just an overwhelming force dis, 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 descending on the school, do you think that was the right move? Well, I think let's put it let's play this out in two ways. If it was an active shooter, no one would question that, right? I mean, what what is all law enforcement active shooter training is engage the adversary as quickly as possible to stop the harm, right? With overwhelming force. With overwhelming force. So that's what you do. I think, though, the thing we've got to learn at, and, and of course, once those 911 calls are made, you have to go through and search the whole school. You have to go through the drill. But what you know, what I think you need to do is there needs to be some way to change the temperature on this, right? So for example, you know, one of the areas of risk that has been looked at over the last 10 years with enhanced 911 is how ambulances respond to patients. So in a community that has enhanced 911, what that means is the dispatcher is actually medically trained and they're talking to the victim. So let's say, you know, Johnny has fallen down and twisted his ankle that ambulance is not going to go lights and sirens. It's going to drive at normal highway speeds because there is no immediate harm that's going to be done if the ambulance shows up 20 minutes later, which is totally different, obviously, than someone is dropped and is having a cardiac episode, right? So communities that have leveraged enhanced 911, what's happening there is that they are dramatically reducing the risk of high-speed ambulances flying through communities to things that are otherwise benign incidents. You know, so in other words, there's a temperature. And, you, you know, you maybe hear in cop shows, you know, like code one, code two, code three. These codes tell the individuals what the response is, what is required for that particular incident. And of course, with CAD, if things change in the patient, they can speed up the response. Maybe we need the same type of temperature on a response to some of these types of incidents where, you know, okay, it's a shooting in a school, it's all out, but once we kind of know that maybe this is starting to look a little bit more like a nothing burger, we peel that back a degree. Maybe, you know, maybe we've got a volume on this, right? Versus, okay, it is a potential active shooter at a, um, you know, at a, a, a you know, a, a warehouse that's empty at three o'clock in the morning, you know, maybe that's a slightly different response. And I, I think, look, I think the other thing is the minute you say active shooter in school over police radio, it doesn't matter who that law enforcement officer is. They're going to that school as fast as they can. And that's what we want. But how do we turn the volume back down once we know that maybe it's not as elevated as we think it is? Do you, do you have any sense for, like, to what degree did law enforcement have access to the school's surveillance cameras? Is, was, is there any real-time access? I have no idea, but I highly doubt it. Yeah, I do too. But I, I think that's an interesting thing to consider in, you know, in today's day and age. What, what, what difference or, or how advantageous would it be for law enforcement to be able to bring up the cameras remotely? You know, that police officer who's going to be first on the scene in their vehicle to be able to bring up the lobby camera... <laughs> You know, like it's not a crazy idea that that technology would be possible. Of course, you know, obviously schools don't have all the money in the world, but. Yeah, but this, this is a really interesting question you're posing, Dave. Like, okay, on one hand, in an emergency response, I could see where that would be incredibly valuable, right? And, you know, in the case of like this school, again, well-funded private school, they've got cameras everywhere. I'm sure there's some central feed for all of this. Okay, well, this is a law policy and privacy podcast. What happens if the cops on an idle Tuesday are sitting in the office and they see, uh, you know, Johnny smoking weed in the hallway? Do they respond to that? Right. Yeah. You know, another thing that comes to mind, a good question for you is, to what degree did the school have its own security team? Right. Because all public schools, at least in Maryland, I know have SROs and 
I'm sure that's right. My yeah. kid's high school has a police officer on site all the time. Uh, my understanding, so first of all, it's a private school, so they have their own private security and capabilities. I do not know what those are. Um, and even if I did, I wouldn't talk about it, right? Because I'm sure that's something they want to keep private. They also have very, uh, I know they have very good relationship with local law enforcement. But uh, let me give you a, but here's the interesting thing. Like, uh, let me contrast this with the school that my daughter went to. So this was my son's school. My daughter's school is also a large private school with a large campus. They have kind of one private security officer that's, you know, kind of drives around and makes sure kids aren't doing things they shouldn't be doing at three o'clock in the morning. But, you know, there's there's no armed presence. There's And the, more importantly, there's no locks on the doors during the day. Like, um, you know, my son's school where this incident occurred, there's locks in every door. Every kid has to have a badge on them at all times. It's a, it's a pretty, you know, you, you walk around, you're like, this is a very secure place. Right. I, I can't just walk into my son's high school off the street. You know, you have to buzz in and right. st state your business <laughs> and then they they let you in. Versus my daughter's school is basically an open campus. You could be anybody walking around that place. You know, I think that that is also an interesting question in this. What is the standard? How does that standard get enforced? And is there a li eventual liability if you're not following a certain standard? Well, I, I mean, look, I, it, it, let's go to the the view from space, right? Uh, and say that I think one of the things that's hard for me personally to accept is that this is where we find ourselves at all. Right, that 100%. Having, having yeah. grown up in a world we can where... we all just stop and acknowledge that, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I never... I know my experience, you know, my middle class upbringing in the suburbs, going to public schools, I never thought of school as being anything but a safe space. And so this idea that uh, of lockdown drills and and that that is the thing we have come to accept rather than coming at the the other problems, which we don't have time to get into in this <laughs> podcast today, but I think we all know what they are right. in terms of you know the availability and and uh, uh, use of, of weapons and and so so on and so forth, which is this uniquely American problem. Um, that instead of coming at that because of the political realities that we face, we are unable to come at that. And um, if uh, just to, to add an editorial uh, little bit here. Um, you know, to me, uh, our nation lo lost its soul a bit after Sandy Hook. Um, the, the idea that someone could come in and, and gun down our toddlers and we really haven't done much about that since then. I'll just let Dave take all the angry emails on this one, by the way. Oh, uh, yeah. And I, I know I'm putting it out there yeah. and, um, you know, I said, that's my opinion. Um, but, uh, it, it, frustrates me and it boggles my mind that we can't do a better job with this. Um, we cannot protect our children in schools and that instead they're faced with the trauma that you describe, mm -hmm. both for the kids and Caleb, you as a parent and your wife, to get the message that there's an active shooter at the school. I don't know what that's like as a parent, but I cannot imagine things that could be much worse. And yet here we are and we're preparing for that rather than what every other civilized nation in the world seems to be able to do and not have this be a thing. So I'll but, get but off my soapbox. Are, but we are here, right? I mean... Well, uh, that's as, the thing. That's, it is the reality of where we are, so we have to deal with what we've got. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. We have to be realistic. And this is... And, and, and let me say, I mean, I think everybody is in good faith trying to deal with this, the law enforcement people, the teachers, right. nobody's put in a good situation, the parents. But um, it just makes me sad. Yeah, I mean, that is the very important 30,000-foot view that I think we can't ignore. But as you say, Caleb, like, we are in this world. And so <laughs> given the fact that the three of us can't change gun policy in this country, I do think having a worthwhile discussion about 
what to do in these scenarios and how do we react and how do we mitigate harm, I think is just a very important conversation to have. So let me wrap up with this, Caleb. Um, Has anything changed in your community? Having been through this experience, has the school, has law enforcement, have the parents, what what happened after the fact in terms of the conversations about this and uh, people reevaluating best practices or saying everything went well and we should continue to to operate the way that we have? Well, I, I think, first of all, I think the school did an exceptional job in kind of handling this. And, you know, it, it is is never a good situation. But what is so powerful, I think, out of this situation is that it's a very good demonstration in my mind that the investment made in preparedness, the investment made in training, the investment made in making drills, all came through and worked when something still went horribly wrong. I would, I mean, this is a horrible thing to think about, but I would purport that had that investment not been made, had administrators not imagined what their worst day looked like, Had there not been a relationship with the local police department, this could have ended way, way worse. So, you know, my hope in kind of bringing this story here and talking about it is it gives us the opportunity to do two things. One, recognize, as we've talked about with cyber, as we've talked about other things, preparation matters. And hot washing these incidents when they do occur to look at every little element that could fi- get fine-tuned matters, right? Um, I think the second thing to recognize with this is that the victims are far bigger and far broader than just the people in that school. And maybe it's time to start thinking about all of that community in our response plan. And in particular, this idea of Maybe there's some sort of de-escalation protocol. And that even comes in when we have cyber incidents. Like, how do you shut it down? How do you turn down the team when you realize you've got nothing? That isn't in most plans today. And I think it needs to be. All right. Well, I think we are going to wrap it up there again. uh, Caleb, thank you so much for taking the time for us today. This is a really uh, interesting conversation. Uh, Again, Caleb Barlow is the CEO at Cyberbit and uh, a regular welcome guest here on our show. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's Cyber Corps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. A quick reminder that N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. Our executive producer is Jennifer Iben. This show is edited by Trey Hester. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. <laughs>